Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Great to be with you. Can I acknowledge uh, Paul Green, uh, Michael Callahan, uh, Senator Jacinta Collins, and I'm sure there are numerous others, but if I just say friends with one and all, I hope you'll accept that as a mark of my respect for you all here. And the fact that I appreciate very much the chance to speak to you. <coughs> Forgive me for not being in a suit. There's a reason. And the reason is that my son and his wife had a little baby boy last night in Tamworth. Uh, and I'm changing my program. And thank you so much for your help and cooperation with this so that I can jump on the plane and go and be with him. Thanks, I suspect, to Telstra. He tried to ring me six times last night. <laughs> my wife tried to ring me twice. The fact that I didn't take the calls adds to the urgency for me. Just to be honest, we're very close. I need to go and see them all. So thank you for your understanding. So, Ocker, as we already call him, uh, Oliver Kenneth Anderson, <laughs> has arrived in a world very different uh, in many ways and facing extraordinarily different challenges to the one that I arrived in some six generations ago. And I was thinking about this as I came in this morning. My father went within an ace of losing his life in the North African desert, in Monty's great push back against Rommel, second day of Al Alamein. It was not expected to live, but he did. It badly impacted and disrupted his life. He married quite a few years after the war, when he was already into, well into his 30s, at St. Stephen's, just opposite, when it was a Presbyterian church. Uh, and I was born a couple of years after that. <coughs> My parents felt free to enrol me in an Anglican boarding school in Sydney. Father who wrote my biography to my horror one day of murders in my office. Uh, I'd authorised the biography, had a great wad of papers, it was about that high, and I said, now Paul, what on earth are those? And he said, these are your school records. <laughs> White. And right on the top was the application form that my parents had filled out. And then my mother's strong writing. Uh, in the section quaintly labelled, the boy is to be prepared for, she had written, the land. <laughs> and my father's very... <laughs> I shouldn't laugh at that. I once, you know, when I was a member of uh, Parliament in Canberra, I always used to... Jacinta, you probably do the same. When the school kids come in to see you, you know, uh, in the school groups to see the Parliament, see how it all works, you find yourself sincerely hoping that um, you get to meet them before they've what's question time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we had a group in one day. It was a terrible, terrible drought. And it was a central school, one of those schools from inland uh, New South Wales where they stop at Year 10. Uh, and uh, uh, it was, uh, they were quite flat and depressed and it was obvious the drought was playing very heavily on them. And I said to them in conversation, how many of you feel that uh, you know, you're know you going to be able to find jobs back in your home district when you finish? And only one put his hand up. All the others felt they'd have to leave that rural community. But they turned on this fellow. It was very obvious he was a nice guy, but perhaps not the sharpest of them. And one of them said, well, how come you don't think you have to go away to get a job? To which he replied in a certain sort of dulcet rural tones, oh, I'll be all right, my dad's going to put me back on the land. <laughs> Sharp mate replied, what as, Tom, fertiliser. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, my mother had filled out that I was to be equipped for the land in my father's even stronger handwriting that had been crossed out and the words university written. <laughs> so I've always been a split personality. <laughs> Uh, and I've pursued both. Uh, but they felt free to enrol me in an Anglican school. That Anglican school felt free to employ a chaplain who preached the Bible. I heard him preach that Bible as a young kid. I was initially unimpressed. I was then deeply offended. It's a terrible thing to have your ideas challenged, isn't it? In this age when we think we should wrap our kids up in cotton wool and not confront them. But eventually, I felt free, that word, to decide in favour of what he was telling me. And I became a believer. And I have lived my life in a free country, as a free man, from a remote little rural community, 
and a land of opportunity, which in one of those sort of terribly mistaken moves that sometimes happens in a free society, I ended up as the Deputy Prime Minister of the country. <laughs> You're probably wondering how that happened. Uh, that makes two of us. <laughs> but it did. Freedom is a wonderful thing. But you know, the new atheists would say that I'd been subjected to child abuse. Would they not? That's what Richard Dawkins says it is, for a child to be exposed to the gospel. He has friends in the old atheists. The communist regime in Beijing has recently determined that children under the age of 18 should not be exposed to the gospel, lest it disturb young minds. Here in Australia, in the context of the Religious Freedom Review, we've heard some very interesting comments. You might have heard, I think it was the, uh, uh, the uh, head of the uh, ACT uh, Chief Assembly, the Chief of the ACT Assembly, uh, who commented, we don't need legislation to preserve freedom of religion. We need legislation to grant us freedom from religion. Crispin Hull is a freelance journalist. I know him well. I like him. I've sat at a table with him at a wedding. Uh, I've even asked him to put speech notes together for me occasionally, not in relation to religious freedom, I have to tell you, but in relation to a railway project I was once involved with. Uh, and uh, uh, he wrote an article that appeared in the Sydney Morning Herald, and he said, we don't need legislation to preserve religious freedom. We need legislation to protect us from religion. And he specifically referred to the same-sex marriage debate. He said, this is a great reform in the continuum of great reforms in Western civilization, the abolition of slavery, uh, labor laws for women and children, the vote for women, same-sex marriage. Now, there's an odd one out there. The others were all actively pursued, spearheaded, driven by Christians. But that doesn't seem to have occurred to him. His very progressive agenda which he points to as a good thing, has overwhelmingly been led by the people he opposes. The people he says, he now says, should be silenced. But my favourite of all of these uh, religion belongs in the private sphere is this one. <coughs> Things have come to a pretty pass when religion is allowed to invade the public square. Is there anyone as a matter of interest who can tell me who said that? Well, it was a man on the rise as a very prominent politician with prime ministerial aspirations. And his name was Lord Melbourne. And he said it about 200 years ago. And he went on to become Prime Minister of Great Britain. And he's remembered for, well, there's a city named after him in Australia. It's not a bad place. <laughs> if we can get past Sydney protecting my own biases. I'm told he was a gifted advisor to the young Queen Victoria who appreciated his counsel. But you don't know much about Lord Melbourne. Consider his legacy against the person he was attacking in particular and that man and his friend's legacy. He was in essence saying religion shouldn't be allowed in the public square. It's a private matter. You have nothing to say to the broader debate, no contribution to make. And his charge was aimed at William Wilberforce. And the Clapton set. Consider their legacy. William Wilberforce led what Eric Metaxas, I think, accurately described. I have a fascination with history. The greatest human rights movement of all times. The left which now opposes us, I don't want to be political here today, but by that, I, let me say it, the militant secular humanists now will want to decry history or airbrush it out. But there was a time when human rights was at the top of the list of their concerns. I'm not quite sure what happened. It doesn't suit the narrative, apparently, the greatest human rights movement. <coughs> Look, you know, the anti-slavery movement was so successful that it turned around the way we think. It didn't just lead to the end of the slave trade and of slavery itself. It changed the way the civilised world, if I can use that term loosely, thought about slavery. We think it's abhorrent, don't we? Only two, at the time this place was settled, 
It was thought of as part of the natural order of things. And by the way, all the great uh, Enlightenment thinkers, we often, I think, falsely paint the Enlightenment as being an enmity somehow with Christianity. That's how we got rid of all those dreadful ideas. We grew out of them. And our freedoms derived from the Enlightenment misunderstands the Enlightenment very, very badly. It was a mixed bag. Much of what happened in the name of the Enlightenment was terrific. And in England, the Enlightenment and Christianity were deeply enmeshed together and advanced our interests. And that's very significant because that's the place that colonised this place. In France, though, it ought to be remembered because when most people say, when they eulogise Enlightenment and Enlightenment figures, they're thinking of Frenchmen and Europeans. Most of those people thought slavery was part of the natural order of things, that women were second-rate uh, uh, humans, uh, and uh, uh, that um, racism was also totally acceptable. The concept of the noble savage comes more out of enlightenment thinking than it does out of Christian thinking. So let's just clean up the history a little bit there. We must get a grip on our history. But it wasn't only the ending of slavery that can be directly traced to people of profound Christian belief. And Wilberforce left no one in anyone to doubt. Read his, read his works. He was driven not by what was popular. In fact, he had everything to lose as an up-and-comer, a man of high wealth, high society, soon on his way to the prime ministership by advocating that Africans' slaves were not goods and chattels, they were human beings. But he did it anyway. Where did that conversion power come from? It came from his Christian faith. It was deep, it was profound. It changed his life. It altered human history. He went on to be active in something like 27 or 28, I think it was, different societies. No, I'm sorry, 77 or 78. A vast number. Even the RSPCA. Blood sports were common and people were frequently very cruel to animals. Uh, a whole lot of other societies the reformation uh, of uh, rotten politics in Great Britain. His, uh, he was backed by people like the Thorntons, the wealthiest people in Britain at the time, uh, by leading thinkers. They were very big on data and on information and on evidence. They built their case, they built their narrative around evidence and around reason. Around evidence and around reason. How much of that do we see now in our society? Such was their legacy, I need not go on. Decent labour laws, an extraordinary influence over the settlement of this colony. I don't know whether Stuart Piggins here. If he is, I'll apologise. If he's not, I'll apologise when I see him. But he's about to launch a brilliant book. He gave me an advanced copy. I had no idea of the influence of the deeply, profoundly believing Christians at the top of the economic and business and political and military world in Britain on the establishment of this country. It is extraordinary. You can trace it through, as a matter of fact. Uh, the 1740s, you saw the great Wesleyan and uh, Whitfield uh, uh, stories of uh, massed uh, Christian revival across Britain, uh, and then up and down the east coast of America, and then from the 1780s on, you get the Declaration of Independence profoundly influenced by that sort of thinking in America. What was its undergirding principle? Freedom based on the worth and the dignity of every individual. <coughs> the same thing in a different form in Britain as the evangelicals came to power. One man who came to power in that time was a fellow called Charles Middleton, the head of the Navy, the world's most powerful Navy, as you know, at that time. He learnt that there was to be a colony centre established in Australia, and he said, terrific, we'll get to work, we'll make sure it's done properly. He chose the ships. They were all under five years old, bar one. He made sure they were properly victualled. The convicts weighed more when they arrived here than when they left England. In those days, that was unheard of. Why? Because he saw them as human beings, and he saw them as people to be rehabilitated, not cast off. And he saw a great future for a nation of freedom. Charles Middleton, the head of the Navy. He was a Bible-believing Christian, and we want to say, no, it doesn't matter. Then you come to the AMP. It's been in the news lately, hasn't it? You know, this wonderful modern world, I love Australia, but I'm really distressed at where we're at. Look at the raw statistics on the breakdown of trust in our society. It is appalling. If you look at the ANU's work, we're in uncharted territory. We've been a sceptical bunch in Australia for a long time. We believe that our politicians are there for themselves, 
not for us. But every so often there's been this incredible resurgence of hope. So, Cinder, I had to tell you, 1996 was one of those moments. <laughs> you know, when people like me were elected to government. It was terrific. You are already there. Well, there you go. But the, the AI News works out. There's a great resurgence of hope and confidence in the system. Now, I don't know how it happened. But we sort of lost it over a period of time. And Australian people decided that they needed a new injection of hope, and that came in 2007. Another massive surge in hope and in confidence in the system. AI News works fascinating on this. Have a look at it. Do you know what's happened since then? We've gone into uncharted waters. The level of distrust is palpable, it has reached unprecedented levels, and elections make no difference. We go on being just as distrustful as ever. That's what we've got to, this brave new world that we've built. And at the same time as that is happening, we now find that our institutions can't be trusted. I'm talking about the ANP, the Australian Mutual Providence Society, was deeply steeped in Christian ethos. And it became, it was set up by believers for the good of the community. Uh, and it became one of the most trusted financial institutions in the world without any shadow of a doubt. Anybody here trust the AMP anymore? But what happens directly when trust breaks down in a free and democratic society? We run for protection. We run for law. We run for regulation. We tie ourselves up in red tape and in caution and in lawfare. That's what happens. And when we don't tie ourselves up in lawfare, we tie ourselves up in law law to try and prevent law lawfare. That's the vicious cycle we've got into. The modern Labour Party in this country was founded largely by evangelical Christian believers. Here's a stunning little factoid for you. In the parliament that was elected in this very place in 1891, there were 35 Labour members, 21 of them were Bible-believing Christians. Not too sure how many of them would be welcome in today's uh, Labour Party, but I'm not here to be political, other than to make a rather provocative comment that they would have thoroughly endorsed something that a later Liberal Prime Minister was to say. So Robert Menzies said this, staunch Presbyterian that he was, and deep thinker who knew his history, democracy is more than a machine. It is a spirit. It is based upon the Christian conception that there is in every human soul a spark of the divine, that with all their inequalities of mind and body, the souls of men stand equal in the sight of God. That's been washed out of our society and washed out of our major political parties to a very alarming degree. And so, I put it to you that we are in danger of fulfilling Malcolm Mugridge's prophecy in, he was a former BBC reporter, lived in Russia. My phone is working, that's very disconcerting, three times. But somebody, there's a silence button on those, so I dare say, but Telstra being Telstra, if you put it on silent, it'll ring louder than ever. It's not run last night, but it was on. Is that right? Something like that. Now, where was I? Um, Malcolm Muggridge, Waterloo Lectures. If you can get a copy of it, they are brilliant. Uh, inaugural Blaise Pascal Lectures, Waterloo, the US in 1978. And he said, we in the West are in danger of ending our experience with freedom and civilization not because we're going to be overtaken by greater military powers, but because we're eating ourselves out from within. I had an extraordinary opportunity a couple of weeks ago to talk to Neil Ferguson. He's a Scot, so that gives him a head start. Um, sorry, is that that's the wrong thing to say? <laughs> Um, and uh, he taught at Oxford, uh, he's now, he was then at Harvard, he's now uh, at Stanford. Prolific writer, economic historian of huge note. And I said to him, and he's just written a fascinating book about the power of social media called The Square of the Tower. I recommend it to you if you can get a hold of it. 
and the, uh, the square and the tower, the imagery is based on Siena in Italy. Have you been there? The beautiful, beautiful city square. Except like Australia Square, it's not square, it's round. Okay? <laughs> so go figure. Uh, and they run the horses there, and you've got a tower that represents government and hierarchy, society sort of institutions, and the square represents the community and the way they network. And that's been completely and absolutely revolutionised by social media. And he actually writes in that book that he wonders whether it hasn't made us so unstable now that we may become ungovernable. It's an interesting insight because he says it's massively exacerbating the other issues that we face. I said to him, what do you think of the three greatest threats confronting the West? And he said, in ascending order, Islamisation, the possibility of miscalculation, secondly, over the rise of China, which sees itself simply recovering its rightful position in the world. It's a staggering thing to go back to Reformation times and contemplate that China was probably responsible for around 30% of global GDP, Britain for about four, America for about two. Uh, you know, and in more recent times, China's slipped back to probably six or seven percent, whilst America and Britain and Europe were probably well over half of global GDP. Now the balance is being altered, and how we handle that process is a big issue for us all, very big issue for us all. But he said the greatest threat, <coughs> the one which if we could only come to grips with, would mean that the other two would not be a problem is that we no longer believe in our own culture. We do not know our history. We are not able to understand the lessons of history. We have no hope, I'm paraphrasing, of avoiding repeating the mistakes of history. We have washed out our memory. Something fascinating that um, uh, uh, Jordan Peterson, you know, this American clinical, Canadian clinical psychologist who's been taking the storm and reaching out to young people so effectively. He talks about the importance of history. He says, look, and again, I'm paraphrasing, but the way I'm understanding what he's saying, it's incredibly important. You burn your hand on the toaster as a little kid, for the rest of your life you do what? You avoid putting your hand on the toaster so you don't get burnt. It's part of your corporate memory. Society's the same. We have so much that we can learn from the classroom of history, probably washed it out of the system. Why? Largely because it doesn't suit the narrative. I've talked about Wilberforce. I've talked about the shaping of our society, the establishment deeply within our psyche and within our political systems that the worth and dignity of all should be acknowledged. It doesn't suit the modern narrative at all because its sources are Christian and we hate Christianity. The elites now detest Christianity. We've morphed from a view where we thought, broadly speaking as a society, it was true, to a position where we thought it was just one of many truths, to where most of today's intelligentsia will say, it's bad and it's dangerous and you shouldn't expose your children to it. How dumb are we? Why is there such a total disconnect between intelligence and learning on the one hand and wisdom on the other hand? Mm. Somebody I saw the other day commented that wisdom is understanding consequences. If you want to understand consequences, the best place to start is history. Many of you, like me, of course, are Christians. The Bible is history. Can we rely on it? Yes. We can. It's not bunk because it's history. It's to be relied upon because it's faithful and reliable history. Why do we discount our history so readily? As Churchill said, the further you can see into the past, the further you'll be able to see into the future. So what is freedom? What is it? Given that we now have incredibly strongly opposing sets of views on what freedom is and somebody's going to lose badly out of this how might we understand freedom well classically I suppose we talk of negative freedom and positive freedom negative freedom uh, is freedom from fear of oppression fear of being locked up of being persecuted being judged without trial, but also freedom from personal bondage to addiction, to anxiety, and to fear. Now, all of the evidence is that we're not doing very well, actually, on that personal front. The data tells you we're distrustful, 
we're cynical, we're unhappy, anxiety levels up, levels are very high, depression is high, and unbelievably in this country, unbelievably, youth suicide is, is, is at horrifically high levels by international standards. Deloitte's have done some research, which I also find very concerning. 92% of young Australians believe that they will not have the same opportunities and quality of life that their parents and grandparents had. But we would knock the hope out of them in this wonderful new militantly secularist society that we now live in. By their fruits shall they be known? The numbers are reversed in Indonesia, by the way, where 92% of young Indonesians believe that they will have a better life and better opportunities than their parents and grandparents. So, in an understanding, I believe we need to deeply get our minds, deeply get our minds around freedom. What it is, what it is that we're really trying to defend. I was Guinness is here next week. Twelve months ago he gave me a copy of a book that he's written and hasn't hit the bookshelves yet. It's called Last Call for Freedom. Can I urge you, if you do nothing else this year, when it hits the bookshelf, get a copy of it. Because he unpacks the concept of Western freedom. It's, freedom is something that very few human beings down through the ages have known. And many of those who have achieved a degree of personal and political freedom have not been able to hold on to it. Have not been able to hold on to it. It's a fragile flower, infrequently grown, easily lost. You can turn yourself into a cut flower society in a free democracy very easily. We need to be wary. We really do. Janet Albrechtson wrote last year, and there was a great line, I think she's a terrifically interesting writer, that freedom of speech is the premier freedom. It's the first freedom. And her logic, I thought, was very compelling. She said to me, as she said in the article, sorry, not to me, uh, that it's the most important freedom because it's the one by which we defend all other freedoms. Does that strike a, a resonance with you? It did with me. I put it to a very interesting man called Frank Ferretti last year. Now, Frank Ferruti is a man of the left, and we share neither political nor religious uh, conviction. But he's a warm and friendly man, and we've had a couple of great conversations, and here's a little plug, you can find one of them on my website, it's on amazon.net.au. Uh, now, he's written a book, uh, What's Happening in Our Universities, and he says, in the 60s when I was a student radical, we tested the boundaries. We wanted to push hard on every idea and every institution, find the weak points to see what we, you know, regardless of how that might have ended up, we were about expanding our minds. Our universities today, they're about closing our minds. This is a man of the left who works in universities, has all his life, that's what he's writing. And he says, we have microaggression warnings and we have trigger warnings and we have safe places and we have platform denying because we don't want to offend our students. And courses are now written not to challenge not to expand thinking, but to avoid offence. Because academics don't like being hauled before some tribunal because a student said, I was offended and I had to go to a safe place. Is that what we've got to? But I put it to him in this interview. I said, uh, uh, is free speech the first and most important freedom? And he said, no, no, it's not. He said, you should know that as a Christian. I said, why, what do you mean? He said, conscience. Freedom of conscience is the first decision. It was the first freedom. He said our forebears in uh, Europe learnt that burning another human being at the stake is a truly revolting thing to do to somebody because they hold a minority view. And it's a particularly stupid thing to do when you stop and think that one day that minority might be in a majority and they'll turn around and go to the other side. And we grew up. And so we learnt the genius in many ways of freedom at the heart of Western society is that we learnt to respect people of different views. They all have worth, they all have dignity, they ought to be able to put their views, as Lord Acton put it, without fear of government sanction or of mob sanction. I might say without fear of the guillotine, the hangman's neck or social ostracisation by social media which is killing many of our young people. Neil Ferguson commented, we need to understand how dangerously social media is accelerating the process of polarisation in our society because 
The left, which is growing, talks to itself. The right, which is growing, talks to itself. The middle feels left out. And he said, what is really horrendous is the hateful way people talk to one another on social media. So it hasn't broken into violence yet, but the sentiments are sure there. And he's right, isn't he? And this remarkable man, I don't say that lightly because he is, Frank Ferruti, the man of the left, says to me towards the end of our conversation, you know, John, all the old barriers have broken down. Here you are, you and I are talking, and we're recognising that there are differences between us which are less significant than the things we have in common. You as a man of faith, me as a man of no faith, you as a man of conservative politics, me as a man of the left, we're both recognising that respect for the worth and the dignity of each individual and their right to put their most passionately held views is the key determinant of whether or not we will progress as a society. I'm paraphrasing, but that's effectively what he said. I thought that was a pretty valuable insight. I pass it on in my attempt to encourage you to think and to think deeply about what it is that we're seeking to preserve and to fight for as we go forward in a world where there is enormous hostility externally from powers and principalities that don't agree with our version of freedom and internally when so many people essentially now think that our freedom should be defined by the state. In a fascinating comment, Ryan T. Anderson observed that religious freedom should not be seen as a concession of the government to its subjects. And I feel this very deeply. As somebody who's been in government and has also been a private citizen, I don't believe Canberra or this state parliament here should be telling me what my religious rights are. Their job is to protect my religious rights and in large part so that I can then seek to limit the power of the state. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and unto God that which is God's. I don't want a big, obtrusive state. I want it to be a function and an extension of a service provision, if you like, and of protection services on behalf of me and my fellow Australians. I do not want to be a function of the state. And therein, of course, lies one of the greatest and fundamental differences of all as we see the quite profound movement towards statism. And listen carefully to what's happening in our educational institutions and amongst the pronouncements of those who run them want to expand their power. And think carefully about programs like Safe Schools. It's effectively saying parents should not be raising their children and instilling in them their chosen and preferred morality. And that brings me to my final point. As we consider what freedom looks like in the area of speech and conscience, please remember what Frank Ferruti said. The first freedom is conscience. I would very slightly and so that I would include in freedom of conscience our most profoundly held beliefs and values and therefore Christian faith. Some of you will want to argue a little over the nuancing of that and you're probably right but that's how I would see them as belonging together in a political sense. And our right to free speech is nothing more nothing less than the right to manifest that most important freedom of all. But the other thing to note, and there are many of you who are lawyers, Western freedoms are carefully codified. They're not abstract, as they were in the case of the French Revolution. You know, liberty, fraternity, what was it? Equality and liberty. Oh, somebody help me. <laughs> liberty, eternity, fraternity, uh, equality. They were abstract. They turned out to be meaningless, didn't they? Ours have been codified. And sometimes that opens up a lawyer's picnic but we ought to attempt to continue to properly define them. And that just lets me comment on two others. Freedom, uh, property freedom rights are absolutely critical to a functioning economy, totally. You have to know that if you work hard and put together some assets, some feudal lord or some state isn't going to come along and abscond with them. But the other one that's vitally important is freedom of association. And I was talking with a great friend from my university days, Annie, Annie Robertson, um, 
a moment ago, and who I think rightly made the point we need to think carefully about how we describe freedom of association because it can rapidly descend into something that sounds exclusive, I, I think I'm paraphrasing, but concerns over whether it sounds elitist uh, or somehow exclusive when we don't want it to. But the right to freedom of association is astonishingly important and taken for granted by every single one of us, including many of those militant secularists who want to now strip out the rights of charities and schools and so forth to choose people uh, to work for them on the basis of whether or not they share that ethos. It's incredibly important. Does anybody seriously suggest that the Greens in Canberra should take an old, um, you know, a believer in traditional values and in marriage and goodness me, I mean, I'm, I'm such a... Such a, a the threatened species that I have no particular problem with the sensible use of fossil fuels. And I'll tell you one of the main reasons, we have a population of about 7 billion for the foreseeable future as a farmer, can I tell you something in simple black and white terms, without fossil fuels for the next few years, you won't be able to feed more than a billion or so of them. So they still have their place. Good grief. Does anybody seriously suggest though that the Greens can or could or should have me as a paid up member running for a Senate spot for them? Of course not. They would say, we don't agree. We choose not to associate with you. They have that absolute right. That absolute right. And just as my parents chose out of freedom to enrol me in a school which suited their ethos and their beliefs, something they were rather surprised, I have to tell you, when I took it a little further than they thought appropriate. <laughs> Old timers might have said he became enthusiastic about faith. Remember, enthusiastic was once an enthusiasm was once a pejorative term. You've gone over the top. But I did. In a free world. And I'm very thankful for it. They had that right. Why should today's parents, the 30, 35% of them, for example, who choose independent schools, lose the right to be secure in the knowledge that the things that they're believing for and looking for in their children's futures? Uh, will not be delivered or cannot be delivered or somehow overruled by the state as though the state has greater rights to the raising of your children than you do. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think I'm sort of getting the wind up and I have talked a long time. I said the other night at the Independent Schools, uh, Christian Schools uh, dinner in Canberra the other day that um, one of the great problems with former politicians is that um, they sometimes have uh, microphone deprivation <laughs> syndrome, a bit like a former crack addict who uh, can't get to the jar fast enough, uh, and you've been silly enough to let me have the mic. Uh, look, it's been a great privilege with you. I'll just try to give you a broad overview. You'll have lawyers with you. Uh, I've done the wrong thing. Uh, you'll have lawyers with you who can unpack a lot more detail. We, the Religious Review uh, has now um, itself hit the government. Uh, what I'm trying to do here is just to build some understanding of what's at stake, what we need to be aiming at. I'll leave it to others to try and unpack more of the detail. I know many of you have done incredibly valuable work uh, in uh, thinking this through and trying to put the case in making submissions. That's one last thing I want you to do. If you believe, as I do, that the most important piece of news any human being needs to hear is the gospel, you will fight to the death for the right to be able to continue to carry it into the public square. And I happen to believe that it is the best thing, and I think history is on my side on this one, for societies at large, we are the beneficiaries of people who believe in the gospel in this country. We didn't fight for freedom. It was handed to us by people who built a society on the foundation of the worth and the dignity of every individual, whether they agreed politically or not. Uh, we ought to be prepared to stand on the shoulders of those giants, at the very least to defend their legacy, but to preserve what they gave us for ourselves and more than ourselves, our children and our grandchildren. Thank you very much.